Welcome to the last episode of North London's Most Read for the season, at least covering games. Episode 34, Big Xhaka episode to cap off the season, 2-0 winning against Brighton. But it wasn't enough to get us into the inaugural European Conference League uh, tournament. We're going to have a debate about that, but we'll get to that. Oh, yeah. Kieran, oh, yeah. what do you think of the game? I mean, it was just... It's what I expected, really. I mean, considering... You know, our form over the last few weeks and the fact that Brighton were safe. I feel like if Brighton were in a relegation fight, that game could have gone a lot different. But I feel like it's just one of them, you know, regular home games where a team finishes the season at home and they get a, you know, get a win. You know, it, it, it hasn't anything. in the past, though. Do you remember when we drew 1 1 against Brighton when if we'd won, we'd have made the Champions League under Emery and Jack gave a dumb penalty? We've also lost yeah. at home the following season against Brighton 1 0 or 2 1 or whatever. So like, these like, games are really games that we slip up on often. But that, that's the, the thing that I was alluding to, the key thing that I meant uh, originally was the fact that um, when you have nothing to play for, whereas in them seasons we did have something to play for when we played for Brighton. Well, we had something to play for. Arguably, what? they didn't, though, you're right. The European so Conference. I'm sure that Arteta <laughs> was saying, I want nah, this. fuck that. Like, do you no, know what I is? know you don't want it, but um, I'm sure Arteta does. Yeah, I know, because he, you know, he wants to stat pad um, and probably get a trophy. But I don't even consider that a trophy. That's, like, lower than the Community Shield for me. That's... What, beating I, out 24 fixtures right, worth of opponents? As an Arsenal opponents. fan, I'm, I'm embarrassed enough to be in the Europa League, let alone be in the Europa Conference League. The fact that it's got conference in the name as well really devalues it. And also, like, I actually think it's the best thing for Arsenal. Like, don't get me wrong, like, I hate that. Let's Tottenham come to it after, because we're going to argue about this yeah, later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on, go but on. Um, let's talk about the game first, and then we'll get to it. Can't be giving away all the good material. Yeah, yeah, choo, 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 choo. All right, so... Um, we start off, it's a good lineup in my opinion. I know you ha- hate Odegaard and you hate Chambers hate and hate don't anyone hate, that has one bad game it. that you remember for a long time don't, and then you get obsessed Odegaard. with them. No, so there was a lineup that I was happy with, namely Gabriel back in defence playing more games, Xhaka yeah. back in midfield as much as we hate on him. I don't think we've got much else to, to play instead. Yeah. Party starting, Pepe on the right, which is interesting because earlier in the season a lot of his good games were coming from the left, but he's also been recently yeah. playing really well from the right. Um, I've got some stuff to talk about him and some stats to quote later on that you already know because I texted you them, but it's still big, big, big stats. I don't know if I read them. To be um, Alba at front. He, what, so you just commented, wow, that's mad, or whatever you said without Probably. actually reading. Really. Just like, oh, <laughs> that would make him stop talking. I had a busy day yesterday, <laughs> hence, hence why we're doing the podcast on Monday instead of yesterday right after the game. But yeah. Um, Saka, interestingly, didn't play. Yeah, he was dropped. I saw that. Um and Martinelli was on the bench, which I'm sure you have an opinion on. Laka came on late on, but so I thought it was a good lineup. You might have your misgivings over it, but we started off like to be honest, it looked like at the beginning it was a typical case of we play the majority of the possession, don't do yeah. that much with it, and then whenever we count once, it looks like that could go in. And under like you know when you've got counters, I hate to say it, but when you've got people like Son, they'll punish you every time on the counter. Yeah, 100%. And Brighton don't have that killer instinct. They don't have many goal scorers. I've seen that they've scored very few goals, but they've had a pretty solid defence. So, you know, yeah. players like, I think it was Yak, Yak Bash, I've forgotten how you pronounce it, the the long-named uh, guy who was countering, and he messed up a couple of big chances that he, like, let the ball yeah. get too far away from him. People like Son that can glue the ball to their feet and finish like madmen, they score against you with those sorts of ones. And so we are at risk. We're just not playing as quality opposition. But we didn't concede and we didn't score in the first half. It was a pretty, like... Uh, you know, we'll do seventy yeah. percent of the possession, but not look massively menacing. Um, but if, but it, we, we'll get a couple of half chances type thing. Yeah, we had a lot of long range shots, and one thing of note yesterday was how Partey he like, wanted won, that goal. He wanted that first goal, didn't he? He was trying everything he could, um, shooting from everywhere. You could just see it on his face; he was getting more and more pissed off every single shot that that wasn't going in. He was getting more and more pissed off, and I think especially with the. Um, the home fans being back and stuff like that. I think he really wanted to put on like, not like a show, but I, I think he wanted to kind of get his first goal in front of the fans and kind of like welcome himself to the fans. But it showed he cared. Like that. that's one thing I, d- I did enjoy. Um, although, you know, he was close on quite a few occasions of scoring and didn't get the goal, but he that worked great. And I know you can say, you know, it's Brian at home and it's... it's I think Brian are a good team. Yeah, no, but I'm, I'm not saying that. But I mean, like, as in like, you can say that like, you know, where was this 10 games ago and all this <laughs> stuff. But I think it... It shows that he does care. He can. He's going to potentially be a really big player for us next season. Once he's got a good preseason in him uh, at Arsenal, I think a lot of things could happen. But um, yeah, like you said, the first half um, was quite uneventful. It was it was one of them nil nil games where it wasn't actually that boring. 
if that makes sense. Because you watch a lot of nil nils and you'd be like, there's been like one shot in the first half, and you're like, that was fucking boring. But like, you know, Brighton played good football. Um, they counted us a few, a few times. They didn't have the quality to take advantage, really, like you've alluded to. Um, and we didn't really have any clear cut chances in the first half. Was the Gabriel header distance. in the first half or the second? Oh, no, that I think that was the. No, that was the first half. That okay. was a very good header. I think that was actually, the closest we came. But it was, yeah. It was a very good header. Yeah. Gabriel is an elite header of the ball, man. He scored some goals that are like not even half chances. They're like quarter chances with headers. He's got that, that forehead, you, man. He's got the power and he's got the the strength to do it. And so I hope we, I hope Rob Holding learns his lesson because he had one not go in because he scored. His, it might have been his first ever goal <laughs> and it didn't count because he was offside or whatever. But. Um, Gabriel scores in the air and I don't think there's any excuse I mean you know I like to talk about goals coming from a variety of different positions and Rob Holding needs to get two or three a season to get us a couple of extra points a season Gabriel is that centre back that can I mean his playing out of the back can be worked on and his composure and stuff like that but he's very I'm I'm still happy with him he's physical yeah yeah. yeah, we need that but also he can contribute at the other end aerially and so I'm happy with that Um, and that was the closest chance of the half yeah, we got our two our two receding hairline uh, centre backs to playing today, so they must have summoned the power of each other. So they've got a full hairline for today's game. <laughs> We're playing three at the back with hairlines. <laughs> Here we go. Who's uh, who's got a bigger forehead out of the two of them? That's the real question. That's I think it's Gabriel. You know, I think Gabriel. I think it just doesn't look rather, as bad because look his like hair Gabriel, looks though. better. Whereas Rob Holdings, like, there's less like hair. Like that's there to like hide the receding hairline. At least what Gabrielle's got is thicker. <laughs> Mate, we're just, we're talking it's like trash bushier. Right now. <laughs> Whereas Rob Holding just looks a bit sad. Like, yeah. <laughs> just shave it off at that point, or just get the old hair transplant in yeah, it. Yeah, he can afford transplant. it, man. He's on like forty k a week. The hair transplant will be like five k. It's yeah. ready. He's probably waiting until the end of the season so he can like come back with it like growing back rather sure. than because I bet you can't ha- go and play the games when you've got like the red patches still when it's healing well you've seen David, David Silva he, he literally no but from... I bet he did his in the summer and then just shaved it until it Man, grew back his was fucking crazy good though when it came back I, know, I don't yeah, want to no, talk about transplant so I'm, I'm like, and you know, Kyle Walker's didn't really work yeah but it's not as bad as it originally was yeah. but yeah uh, Andros Townsend's one's fucking crazy has he had actually. one you know, I just you assumed he seen... always had a full airline. No, you need to check. He's got the he... box cut. Now. He's got the temps Mate, from 2008. After, after this, check Andrew Hansen's uh, hairline like five years ago when he was commentating on ITV and shit, mate. Honestly, it's literally like he was bald. It was like Wayne Rooney bad hairline. Okay, okay. It was crazy. He's um, got a full hairline now. Usually, yeah, if you're no, going, that's what, that's what I'm talking about. you won't get a full one. You'll just get it like No, but Silver's, Silver's one's got completely bad. Townsend's yeah. one's got completely bad. I mean, we should stop talking about hair for so long because no one gives <laughs> There's a There's no football shit. to talk about. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so how are, you, how are you feeling about the start of the second half then when we went, went into it? Well, we scored basically straight away, so obviously that's yeah. not good. But like, if you want to talk about the three minutes before then, then whatever. I was really hoping that Pepe would score two goals that day because he, I knew that he was on eight goals. And I was like, it'd be so good if he gets ten. And it would just be like a really like big... like yeah. The difference mentally between being a nine goal a season scorer and a ten goal a season scorer is so like it's like double do you know what i mean like it's it, you know to be if someone goes oh he got nine goals a season it's like okay that's good but if you get ten it's like oh he's a ten goal a season winger like oh big um i think so and but he you got to take into account that he scored four goals in the last two games so it yeah. is like one of them it's coming like a, a purple patch at the end of the season so i mean it is it's great that he's done that and i think that he needs to be considered a key player for next season but I think that we also need to remember that you know he didn't start as many games as he should have because of William coming in and Arteta loving him for like the first 15 games but he needs to kind of get a bit more game time but he also does need to improve in, in certain aspects as so, well it's worth remembering so let me quote you a stat he got the same amount of goals as Alba this season mm-hmm. and he played less minutes than Alba yep. of the people who got 10 goals or more let me just find the stat on my phone he so he basically gets he gets his goals for minutes because he gets subbed on a lot and gets subbed off and you know comes off the bench and that. Pepe has zero point five six goals per ninety minutes. That's more than a goal every two games. If you started yep. him every single minute of the whole season, he'd have scored around twenty one or twenty two goals. That is big big it's numbers. Crazy, yeah. The only people with ten goals or more with a higher goal per ninety rate are Cavani, Iheanacho, Lacazette, another Arsenal player. Mo Salah, Harry Kane, and Ilkay Gundogan. So, I mean, Gundogan's like, you know, 
a midfielder and is obviously like just crushing it, but the others are all strikers that he's in competition with. No real wingers on that list apart from Salah. So in terms of goal scoring wingers per ninety, he really does it. But that's what I mean. You know, you know, you know, when we first started making these podcasts and like a few months ago and all that sort of stuff, and we we were speaking about it and we were like, we just want to see Pepe start games and get him <laughs> and let him become consistent. And we were saying it at the start of the season. I'm not trying to be like, oh look, look, look what's happened because we've said it. Like I'm not trying to like blow our own trumpet or anything like that. But we what we said with Pepe, so he costs a lot of money. He needs to start some games to see if he can build up some consistency. At the moment. I say out of the last fifteen games we've played, he's probably started about twelve or thirteen. If I'm correct me if I'm wrong, and now you see that he's actually in the best form of his Arsenal career because he's actually starting games and he's actually getting the time to be on the pitch instead of play one game, get put on the bench for three games, then come on for ten minutes, yeah. then start one game. Do you know what I mean it, it, you can't build up any sort of consistency yeah. playing like that? So now that Arteta's hopefully, well, I mean. William's probably not going to be in the picture. Like maybe if we said apparently him, William wants to leave, and there's a yeah. bid from Inter Miami, which is David Beckham's club. That would be That'd so be good. good for us be because we could get his wages off. I said to you that uh, I mean I remember again going back to it, but I remember saying like three, four, five months ago about that we could sell William in the summer. Yeah. and you saying that we couldn't. Um, and no, I said we could. Wages. I said we could sell him. Mm, I said be on high wages. I'm sure we could take like a lower league. Uh, it's, it's whether William would go to a West Ham type West Brom sorry not West Ham because they're actually doing quite well now but like a like a Newcastle or something like that if he wouldn't really I don't remember to. you saying that but I'll, we can quote it I, I, no I said did. we could I don't believe so we can check it regardless yeah I don't know what fucking podcast is going to be on me but this is our 34th <laughs> well sure I mean we'll I'm, I'm, uh, I think back then we may have thought William was on like 150 160 a week he's on yeah. 100 which actually isn't that mental so we could shift that yeah. So if, if it might be a change of information, and also I didn't respect William to be this sort of gallant and be like, I do want to leave and I'm fine leaving, rather than just being a wage thief. So actually, I respect that at least. Like you was... recognise that it hasn't gone well, and you want out to do like what left you have with your career, and I respect that. Yeah, and I think David Louise going to is going to be a big like they're basically best friends and they own a restaurant together in London, and I yeah. think that Louise leaving is also good to get William to leave as well. Yeah, I'm still gutted personality-wise to have David Luiz go. I didn't think that I would like him as much as I ended up liking him. Yeah. I remember when we signed him, you were like, what have we done? This is a clown. And, you I know, didn't hate him that much, man. You, so I think you called him a clown. But he does look a bit like a clown, so it's like no, unfortunate. No, no, no. I, called it, I think when he started having his bad performances, I started calling him I'm a clown. I'm sure you weren't happy when... like this. I mean, this is way before we did the podcast. It was years unhappy. ago. You I weren't was, happy that we signed him. I've always liked him as a defender. I'm not, not a defender, sorry. As a footballer. It's As a CDM, been... <laughs> he'd be perfect. Yeah, yeah, no, like he's got a lot, a lot of good attributes to his game. Like, I mean, as far as like ball playing centre backs, he's over the last. He's decade, one of the best. He's, he's probably yeah, the All best. The best. Not yeah. One of the closest. But as far as defensively, he can go from being one of the worst defenders in the league to being an elite defender in his day. So you never know what you're going to get. You don't like like I was referring to earlier. Consistency is what's key with a team. And that, that's why Man City and Liverpool's have been so good over the years because they've got consistency in their teams and they turn up nine out of ten games, whereas Arsenal turn up four or five out of ten. And that's the difference. That's why we're in this position. I don't think there's an absolute massive gulf in quality between like us and the Champions League teams. I just think that... I mean, Man City and Liverpool, that they've got you know their investment and they've got a lot more world-class players than us, don't get me wrong. But I'm talking about, you know, the Chelsea's, the Man United's and the Tottenham's and West Ham's. Like, there's no, there's not a massive gulf between us. It's just mm -hmm. that they've got consistency in their teams. Well, did you see the Reddit post that was circulating this morning on the Arsenal Reddit, which was like six points off um, fourth and then a, like nah, a bunch of screenshots? Um, no, 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 no. It's not what you think. It says the caption is just six points off fourth place. And then it's just a bunch of screenshots of the first one is the David Luiz knee red that cost us three points. The second is the Pepe handball against Burnley, which is cost us two points. Yep. Um, the other is Martinez clearly fouling Lacazette. The one is yep. Xhaka's offside goal disallowed from a corner header. Um, and there's a couple others that are basically like, and, I'm, and everyone has had judgments, but I feel like, and all the comments from other clubs in that comment section were like, you know what, I really do think Arsenal will get the worst decisions. And I'm not trying to call the conspiracy or whatever, whatever. It doesn't interest me like that. But in all fairness, we probably should have had a fair few extra points this season. And if we, if hypothetically that were to even out, maybe we could, we, we, we should be higher than we were. I mean, I, I would 
severely disagree with that. I think that we're we've almost finished higher than we deserve in the league. I'll be honest. No, the um, football doesn't pass the eye test, but in terms of points got gained, playing not the most like wonderful football, and then adding on those things that we should have gotten equals a number think, that is not like a, a position in the table that is higher than perhaps. I also think that people we give credit do, for do forget when we've had generous decisions go our way, and because they're generous and because they didn't affect us, people just forget about the decisions and. You know, you can say that we've had four or five bad decisions, but I'm sure throughout the season we've probably had not that. No, nothing like that. We've probably had quite a few fortunate ones, and I'm sure we have, but we just don't remember them because no, nothing like handballs in the us. box. They didn't count and stuff. You know, I, I can. I remember. I can't remember what, specifically what game it was, but it might might have even been against Chelsea, where there was a Rob Holding handball at Stamford Bridge that they didn't give. And stuff like that, you know. It yeah, there was a weird rule technicality for that that they said of the commentary at the time that I didn't understand, but that made it not. But I didn't. But that they've changed the rule for handball for the season. I'm just, I'm just saying that there have we've definitely had fortunate decisions as well. I think you can't be saying you know we should be higher in the league or we should have Champions League because VAR fucked us over. Like no, we've been nowhere near good enough. And it, I feel like after this season, if we snuck into the Champions League at the end, it would. I don't know. I just still feel like we wouldn't even deserve it, or even be close to deserving it. I don't even think we deserve Europa League, based on the basis of how bad we've been this season. You know, well, we're not in the Europa League, so. And that, that's what I mean. But I think if we did manage to scrape it, or... no, because you, I presume you're talking like about the style of football we've played, and I no, understand no, no, just... that you want it to be great football, but the points don't lie over 38 games much. No, I know, I know that, but what I'm, what I'm trying to say is like the the, the stage of the season where it was important to get points. We didn't get them. And I think the last four, five, six games of the season where we didn't have a lot of pressure because we didn't have much to play for, it's a lot easier to get wins. And that's what we have done. We've probably got, in our last like seven or eight games, we've got near enough 20 points, I'm pretty sure. So that's not difficult when you've got no pressure and you're you you know you're down in 10th and 11th and you've got like relatively easy teams to play that you can kind of stat pad against towards the end of the season to make your season look a lot better. Okay. But. Um, I get what you mean, but I think that we got the amount of points we got and there were some really key decisions that somehow didn't get given that I, maybe cost us those six points. I don't think we deserve to be any higher on the table than we are. That's that's all I'm alluding to. Um, We should probably go back into the, just finish off the game highlights and shit. All right, so Pepe um, scores a good finish at yeah, the 48th. Good, another goal on his right foot as well. He's actually... But I think it was last week that he scored another goal on his right foot. And I remember him scoring, I think that was a goal against Wolves, you know, when he did that weird run down the wing and cut yeah. back on his right foot and scores. I think that might be three or four goals he scored this season on his right foot, which the season previously he never used his right foot. So it was nice to see. And it was a really confident finish as well. He had a really good first touch. It was a lovely touch. first touch. Yeah. And a very, very, very good finish with his right foot where... You know, you can see that he's getting more confident. He's demanding. If you actually watch that that passage of play when he demands the ball, he's like fucking give me the ball. It was like he's signalling with his hand, and like the Pepe of last season probably wouldn't have done that. So it's good to see that he's high on confidence. Mm. And we've always said it that he's a confidence player, haven't we? Yeah, he's a quiet player naturally. Like he's, a, I think he's quite yeah. a personality. Like you don't hear him going off on yeah. social media and being like massively extroverted. I also think it's probably something to do with that. I bet his English is better now, so he feels yeah. more confident communicating. And yeah, and he feels definitely probably more comfortable in the team and he's probably got his manager's trust which helps even more he doesn't think like oh if i muck up um you know once i'm gonna be hauled off or i'm gonna be subbed early he, his manager trusts him a bit more yeah and then you we saw it with his confidence like i think just over 10 minutes later he then gets his second goal and it's just this is a, like a classic pepe goal like this is what you yeah we know him for as an arsenal fan i remember him scoring a very similar goal um I mean, it's it's quite similar to the the Palace goal last week, but it's more similar to. I remember well, it was scoring, more placed. It was either West Ham or Sheffield United really early in the season, like one of our first. Two yeah, games yeah, of the yeah. Season, the Sheffield one. Scored, I think it was a Sheffield United one, um, and it was just very similar. And it's the placed it's corner effort. left yeah. foot cut. Yeah, and that's his signature. You know, like how Henry always had the it was almost the opposite. He'd come in off the left and he'd bend it into the far corner. Yeah. Pepe is like the complete opposite of that. And I'm not obviously trying to compare the two players, but I mean that is his signature goal. Um, and I'm hoping to see a lot more of that next season from him. So he gets the second goal. No, yeah. uh, he could have had a hat trick if it had been passed to when I yeah. can't remember who was running and just didn't pass to him when he was in open space. I can't remember what that was. But um, neither side got another goal after that. And then at the last moment, 
Tottenham come back from behind to beat Leicester, which one puts Leicester out of the Champions League, which I wanted them to get in over Chelsea, yeah, and two stops us getting into the Conference League, which I wanted to be in, but you didn't. So that's <laughs> how it was. We ended up not getting into Europe. There are benefits in that we don't have all those extra fixtures, but I also yeah. think there's a double negative in that one, we aren't going to get a trophy for that, which I think would have been a fairly safe ish bet that for. Trophy. And two, that trophy. and two, it means that Spurs will probably win a trophy next season because they are the only big team in it. Yeah, I mean... So if we've gifted them a trophy, I'll be gutted. Nah, because this is Tottenham and you've got to remember that Tottenham aren't going to win that, let's be honest. Harry Kane's leaving. Son will probably want to leave too. There's going to I be doubt Son down leaves. There's going to be Mount down. That, did you watch the... I mean, I didn't watch the hour-long one with Neville on the golf course, but I watched the five-minute one that they yeah, released a couple of days before and that was serious serious juicy gossip in he's there he's very man. honest wasn't he he's very honest i'll give him that oh i'm over the moon i don't I mean, want him against us at tottenham the thing is though that he's probably gonna <laughs> go to you know a man united a man city or a chelsea and then you know, he won't go to chelsea against us levy, levy will not have let that happen to chelsea yeah well, well we'll see what happens levy likes money so we'll see what happens but then I, he'd he'd must get booted out of the club by the tottenham fans if he sells him to chelsea I feel like Man City is probably the most natural yeah. fit, but it's whether... Well, they... he said he wants to play with De Bruyne, and also, apparently, in the England camps of late, he's been sort of discussing his role in the team with the Man City players that get called up for England, who have yeah. been trying to sort of do the agent deal through him. Should we Should we go into this uh, Europa League conference chat before it gets too late? Because I want to get some, like... Me and you are going to have beef over this straight up. I have my opinion, you have yours. You go ahead first. Right, we've so, already said all the good stuff anyway, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. But see, the way I'm looking at it is that one, obviously, I didn't want Tottenham to finish above us, um, but I feel like going into the Conference League for them, it's a small victory for us because one, I don't want to be in that competition. I don't think there's many Arsenal fans that want to be in that competition. It's basically a third-rate European competition. So even if you win it, you don't want the old bronze medal, mate. I feel like it's as important as like a fucking Audi Cup, basically. No, it's more win. than that. It's more than that. I, I don't. I don't agree. It's basically like a friendly tournament. It's. It's got no. Real no, basis it, it, on I'm sh- try saying that to all the smaller nation teams that really, really want to win it. I'm talking, but this is from an Arsenal perspective. I'm not talking about if I was a team like I don't know Leeds United or Aston Villa, Newcastle Wolves, and I was in it, then it's completely different but we're Arsenal so we need to remember that and not just have little low standards like I've, I think not saying that them teams have notoriously low standards but they haven't been in European competitions consistency like we have and been you know in one Premier League's like recently you know well not well, we have won it recently, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean you but can, you know you like winning, 17 years mate <laughs> but I'm talking about like winners stuff do you know what I mean and I feel like with this team um we play a lot of you know Thursday night Sunday um, and we, you know, we travel so far in the Europa League, and then you, I think we'll probably be travelling even further in the Europa Conference League because it has a bit more teams that are out of the way in Europe. Um, so I think recovery times a lot less. So I think when it comes to Premier League games, um, it's a lot harder to recover and actually get good results and be switched on. I feel like if we're playing one game a week, um, well, majority one game a week. I know there'll be competitions like uh, the EFL and um, FA Cup and all that sort of stuff. But I think we can actually get better consistency because we'll be concentrating on predominantly one game a week we'll hopefully there'll be less rotation and less injuries and that's what i mean and that, i think that's what we need and i think for players like party and tierney they won't have to be relied on to play 60 games a season if they can get 40 games a season in or 45 games a season in they're going to be a lot more consistent because uh, they won't be injured all the time and we won't have to rotate them as much i know the only the, the main downside for me is the fact that we won't get to play our younger players as much and that is, that is, you know, I, I do love watching, you know, young players come through. And I feel like it's it's probably not going to be great for players like Martinelli and Balogun, unless there's a plan um, with that. So that that's the, the major downside. But I think, like, as far as helping us finish higher in the table, I actually think it's going to actually help us a lot. And it might actually give us a really big boost to try and get Champions League football because we can just concentrate on the league pretty much. Apart from, obviously, the FA Cup and the Carabao Cup are, are quite important, but... You know, I'd, I'd I'd happily not win one of them to get back into the Champions League in the top four in the table. Well, but I don't know how you feel. These about are it. my three main points, and you've summarised a couple of them. One, more games for younger players, not just Balogun and Martinelli, who's basically a you know bench yeah. player who will play twenty thirty games a season anyway. But mm-hmm. the the Azizes, 
you know the 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 potential Joel Lopez's, the Charlie Patino's, the, yeah, uh, the Marcelo Flores's, well. the young players that could get, get European. They could, but they could also get experience playing at Arsenal. The Tyrese John Jules's, the Balogans, that um, now won't get really a, a look in because they are not going to be risked when you could lose, you know, a Premier League point that could be worth ten million quid. But just quickly, he probably he hasn't been playing these players anyway. So what's to say he would have? Like, but well, it's a year later been... now. They've had an extra year. Yeah, but this is our terror. I reckon that well, we know for a fact that more of them, even players that Balogun got to play in the Europa League that wouldn't have got to play after, after you know, as he's got ten minutes and you know stuff like that. So that's the first one: is young players will get less game time. Number two is it's a trophy, and. I would rather win the trophy to not. Yeah. I, I called you out for being loser's mentality for not wanting to be in it. And I still stand by that. Like, you've got to be in it to win. And you've got to I'm want not. to take on any obstacle that comes your way and try and win it. Because that, what's the point? Mentality. What's the point of not going at it if you're going to go at it? Like, I could never, like, um, like not want to be in a competition. Like, I'm here to compete. I'm here to win. I'm here to kill. Like, no. I, I don't understand how people don't want to be in it. Will affect, it, it will affect our league position massively, being in that competition. That's what I'm trying to say. And the so in, if anything, it's opposite of losers mentality. The third point is the coefficient. So in 2024, I'm sure most of you listening will know the European Champions League format is changing, and a couple of the teams with the highest coefficients that aren't in the Champions League will get in as like a buy um, for being like a big European team. Yeah. Um, from then, which I believe in the current state when you count like the the back end of our last one Champions League that we scrubbed off soon gets yeah. us in that but now we'll have a 0.0000 coefficient for this season because we didn't qualify in them and therefore Good. won't play anything so we're now less likely to get back into the Champions League through the coefficient spot which may don't wanna, if we don't, don't improve in. be our only way of getting back in no i don't want i don't want to get i don't want to get in it during that way i want to deserve to be in it so i feel like that's just a false a full spy into a tournament. I want to, I want to deserve to be in a tournament. Those are three good reasons. That's, a lo- that's losers. That's losing mentality. You're saying that I've got losing mentality. You don't want to be in a tournament. Yeah, because it's it will definitely affect us in the league next season. Like the main problem at Arsenal isn't you know. No, the that's Europa- the person. Is, that's no, no, the, no, 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 you're no, no, that mate who, no, if you're going out no. on the cess, they're like, oh, I can't it, come out. I've got work tomorrow. It might affect my work. No, you come out no, and you kill. No. So the thing is, right? We we don't want like. What would you rather do? Would you rather win the Europa Conference League, right? And I know and, what you're about still... to say is you're about to say is and then but not get in the Champions League because of our league position. But what you're yeah. saying, you're putting all your eggs in one basket with I'm that. Not and you're, and then basket. if we don't come in top four, we we haven't got like we've. I know what you mean. There's a trade off, right? basically like 60 70 percent chance win the trophy but then make it a little bit less likely that we get in top four in the league or risk it all on the top we've four got, then you've also got not, to remember we've maybe. got no no given god given right to win this trophy and we're not like yeah so i'm not giving it a hundred percent chance potentially we could be favorites but then you're still putting all your eggs in your basket that we're going to win this and we're also not no, because i don't think you this. have to put your eggs in one basket to win this you can see what happens Happens like Dynamo Zagreb, not Tottenham out. Slavia Prague, not. I'm not, not saying it's a guarantee. I'm saying it's a, we're in another tournament to win trophies, right? We're only in three trophies now. We could be in four. Yeah, but it, it it's the same basis of saying like, why are we not going all out in the Carabao Cup? Why are we not all out, going all out in the FA Cup? Like that's a trophy, but ultimately, if you ask any answer, we've won so many FA Cups that. With any Arsenal fan would just this season would rather just finish higher in the league, have a better season in the league yeah. than win a pointless fucking Also, I hate to say it, right, but if we have a disaster under our test in next season, but we'd win the Conference League for whatever reason, that's a spot in the Europa League, if which then if we come 10th or 9th, we get into that still. Yeah, but we Arsenal fans don't want the Europa League. No, but then if we win that, we can get into the Champions League. But we're not, like... Let's be honest. Like the Europa League is not an easy competition to win. I think no, but we're that. in it to win it. I know, of course. And I'm saying we've been very. And you'd close. rather we've be been, in that, wouldn't you? Yeah, we've been semi-final, final, semi-final, like a lot. You know what I mean? And I'm saying that ideally, I think every you know every Arsenal fan this season was hoping and clinging on to the fact that we'd win, you know, the Europa League, so we could get back into the Champions League. But it's not happened, and it doesn't make a god-given right that it's easy to win. And I'm not even. I don't. Is that 
exactly say that this... Nor is top four. No, neither do I, but I'm saying there's been many teams throughout you know, the seasons where they haven't had European football in the week and they finished a lot higher in the league. I'm not saying that that's going to happen and that we're going to fucking finish fourth in the league, but I'm saying it becomes a lot more possible when you're not in competitions like this because if we had got Europa League, I'd be happy to win the Europa League because there's a chance of Champions League. But even, you know, I've, I feel like it's nice and refreshing to not have... We've been had European football for 25 years. I feel like for one season being out of it, isn't the worst thing in the world. Let's well, see what happens. Well, it depends what the response is from the team. And I think I think it will improve. I mean, the, the thing is... Like, also, is... sorry to say this as well and interrupt yeah, to you, but if we do have an uptick in form because of a less congested um, fixture schedule yeah. and you don't like Arteta but it makes him look better, that uh, makes yeah. it longer until he goes to you as an Arteta out person. That isn't what you want. I mean, the, the thing is, it's got to the stage now where Arteta clearly isn't leaving. So Arsenal fans have got to support him. Like, you, yeah. we've got to put our support behind the team. I'm not one of these toxic people that's like, just because I believe that he should have gone at quite a few stages this season, I'm going to stop supporting him. Because if the club have made the decision to keep him, then we've got to support him and the team. Yeah. Because there's no point being toxic and negative for no reason. Yeah. So, you know, the only thing I'll say is if he has a poor start to next season, then, you know, there's going to be big questions and we'll probably he'll probably be fired. But let's just hope that he can continue the form that he's had in the second half of the season into this season. And, you know, you never know where it could take us. I mean, we're not going to get it. We're nowhere near challenging. We won't, regardless of what happens this summer, we're not going to challenge next season. But at least we can try and challenge for the top four. And we haven't challenged for the we top four. We are third for place counting Christmas form, basically. Yeah, that's um, what I mean. So we which, keep that up. But so do you think we've improved over the course of the season? Well, of course we have. Because so do you, you think we play better? Because it feels like our football is just as bad. We just get better results. I mean... In my you, opinion. Well, I think it's it's worth noting what you're comparing it to. Because when, <laughs> in, in, our, in, in our first 15 games of the season, I think we had 15 or 16 points. And we were losing 1-0 at home to Burnley and we couldn't create any chances. We had hardly any shots on target throughout a lot of them games. And we were barely scoring goals. We've obviously improved. We're scoring more goals. We're playing more attacking football, and we're because you know he was playing a lot of five at the back at home against lower league teams. Now we're playing four at the back, and we've got a lot more of attacking formation. Um, he's selecting the right players, which he didn't do for a long time because he was blinded by you know players like William. He thought that they were the cream of the crop when they weren't clearly, and any Arsenal fan could see that. Eventually, he learned that one at least. I mean, event eventually he's learned. He wasn't too stubborn that he. But it took him a long, no, long time. No, but he time. was way too stubborn for a he long was. time. No, no, he was. But, you know, he he learnt a lot from Wenger, I'm sure. And Wenger had them tendencies. But we've got to, you know, he's he's improved us in the second half of the season. But you've got to take into account how bad we were in the first half of the season. And I think if we can continue the second half of the season into the next season, then it will make us in and around the Champions League places. Mm-hmm. But it's a lot easier to perform better when you yeah, perform he's got, so badly. he's got... In my opinion, because the fact that we don't have these fixtures that everyone else has, he's got to do even better than our minimum expectations yeah. now because it's 100%. all in his favour now. And with the Cronkies under pressure, they're 100% going to back him in the market and we're going to spend yeah. a lot of money, I feel, because uh, fickle fans will forget that they hated him once the, you know some fashion, fashionable player is coming in, which works to our favour, obviously, now. So given the fact that we can expect a decent transfer windows business as well as the fact that we're not playing fixtures there's really no it the the goal has to be top four or you have yeah. not done your job at all and you that can't and it's got to be top four even if we haven't finished in the top four in the last few seasons because we're arsenal football club and exactly. this we'll never have a better shot at it than this and we are still a big club we've just been playing poorly and we've been mismanaged and this is absolutely the season where we have to get top four yeah, no, I just agree. I feel like if he doesn't, he's got to go. Like a lot of people like, have had their uh, expectations sort of anchored down by recent performances and like, be like, oh, no, but you know what? I'll tell you what, if we finish sixth this year and then we finish fifth next year, then we can get top four. No, 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 no. We were never supposed to finish fifth or sixth. Yeah. You've been blinded by the mismanagement that we've been under. It has to be top four anyway, but now especially with the fact that we're not in these extra fixtures and I presume we're going to get a bit of money coming in and we'll get a good 10, we'll get a good striker, we'll get a good right back to replace better, all of this 10. stuff another good term we'll get to that um there's no excuse absolutely zero excuse also on that subject because i forgot this but since emil smith rose come into the squad we haven't had fans in the stadium he finally got like a, a like because saka has been playing 
before yeah. the before the COVID hit and properly went sure. and killed it all off. But Smith Rowe's never had that experience of being like clapped off the pitch or being like like. Uh, you know, he's never really had the appreciation because his only game before that was a game against Man City we lost like two, three years ago. And so that was so nice for him to be able to get and see yeah. what his performances have earned respect-wise amongst the fans over the last six months or so. And I, I, that that for meant sure. a lot, I think, no, to him. I'm happy for Smith Rowe. And it's, I think it's becoming clear to see that his ceiling is getting closer and closer and closer to Saka's. I'm really excited. I think mm. even though there was a lot to be negative about, I do feel weirdly positive going into the next season with the fact... I mean, unfortunately, Saka didn't repeat his earlier form in the end, but then yeah. Smith Rowe, I think, he's got even better. He has, he has. And he's played in a lot of different positions. And he'll go to it? the Euros as well, yeah. which will make things more difficult, whereas I don't think Saka... Uh, I don't think Smith Rowe will. I don't think Earl Holding will. He I don't should. think Joe Willock, here, don't, Joe Willock won't, even though he's been so great yeah. since January. So he'll be unfortunately more tired, but that's just how it is. And I, I'm glad that he gets to go to the Euros because he deserves it. And given yeah. that we've got a 26-man squad, he'll definitely be in it because he's so versatile. Oh, he's got to be. He's got to be. Yeah, that's what I mean. He's, he can play in so many different positions. Um, but it's going to be hard because I feel like with Saka as well that Pepe's almost almost made that right-wing position his now. Like, because of how good he he's been. He can go back on the left, though. So yeah, no, that's what I mean, and I'm not saying, and that that could potentially be a good option, and I, I feel like I wouldn't even be mad if that, if you know, if they were our two wingers next season, and they rotated quite a lot. So like you know, if one fancied a game on the right, the other one switched over, and we'll just kind of they'll find their best positions between each other because there are definitely our two best wingers at the club. So with Alba playing up top seemingly, and them two playing, and William leaving, do we get Reese Nelson back in for next season, or do we buy more wingers now? Um, I don't know. I'm not convinced of Reese Nelson. I feel like we should. Um, put it, I, I think there's definitely places we need to buy first. We were um, so, actually we weren't thinking about wingers last time we said this, but actually when you think about it, if Alba's playing up top and Williams going, we might need to get a winger in, and that's yeah. actually, that will be what the Cronkies to be a flashy winger. Who yeah, instead like... of actually the position we need. <laughs> <laughs> but I I think it's worth worth noting as well. Like I don't I don't know if you've you've noticed over the last few weeks, but. I don't know if this is a sign of what's going to happen in the summer, but I feel like Lacazette's almost been frozen out of the team yeah, a little yeah. bit. So is Bellerin. So I feel like it might suggest that Lacazette's going to be sold in the summer. Yeah, also his contract's got a year left, and when they asked him in the interview, he was like, yeah, we'll uh, talk about it in the summer. I mean, like, I feel like like, if Lacazette's you avoid gone. that kind of subject, he's going to go, I think. I think he is gone. Which is bad, I because think I think he suits our team better than Alba right now. 100%. And... I think he it would have would, got 16, 17 Premier League goals a season if he played. 100%. He got 13, like off the 25, 30 games he got to play. I don't think he scored hardly. I think he only scored a couple penalties maybe as well. So it's, it's, you know, he had a, he had a decent season for when he played because his goals per minute is pretty decent. But I feel like yeah, one of the top five in the season for people above top uh, ten goals. They were they were always going to back Alba over Lacazette. That's that's the problem though. Yeah. Um. So you know, I think Lac is going, and then. Hopefully it means more game time for Balogun and Martinelli, and we'll see yeah. what happens. Well, they might, they might buy. It could well be that Balogun striker. gets shunted out onto the wings as a substitute, uh, like right winger or something, you know, as well. Potentially, I hope not, but we'll see what happens. He seems like a proper out and out, you know. Yeah, we've also got John Jules. He's been on loan in League One, who can play anywhere basically along the front line on the wings as a sort of false nine cam ten, like forward, like shadow striker type, as well as a, like a, a deep line nine. So. Um, I, I don't know if he'll be brought into the squad or what, but he's actually got League One experience. Yeah, I'm. I'm. You know, I'm. I am excited for next season. I think that, I weirdly enough, like I know you probably won't agree, but I think weirdly enough that because of the fact we're not in a shitty Europa competition, I'm actually a lot more positive, and I actually think that we're going to have a better season. I, it's probably you know, it's it's probably not going to happen. It'll probably get like ten games into the season, and I'm going to be scratching my eyes, and <laughs> we're going to be fucking crying our eyes out. But like. Um, <laughs> No, I'm weirdly positive. I think we've got a lot of good young players coming through. Yeah, we've I think got, Willock, Willock we, coming back could be a big bonus. Well, Arteta's like, saying he's staying now. Yeah, so well, that's good. So I Cheers think, I for think saying has, that. Before we got to post our yeah. clip, you guys. <laughs> I think he, he deserves a... he deserve, What he's done at Newcastle, he deserves a bit of time. And the goal he scored yesterday was a very good goal. I don't know if you saw it. The title for that good. clip on Joe Willett that we haven't posted yet is a banging title. Did you read it in the, in the, yeah, in the yeah, thing? Yeah. It's we'll a banger. Post, we'll post it soon. We might as well. Well, especially now Artes has made the clip yeah. irrelevant. <laughs> Cheers, you prig. Um, we, we were going to harvest the views off that one. Anyway, so yeah. 
to be fair to Joe Willock, he's played well in that system. We don't know if he'll play well in this mm-hmm. system. He's definitely athletically good enough to play the forward 10 position, but he doesn't really play like a 10 to me. No. He's more I of a deep-lying 8 that runs a lot and pushes up uh, into the box. But we need our 10 to be an aggressive presser like on the right and the left yeah. switching positions a lot, which is what Smith Rowe does perfectly. I'm not sure if Joe Willock's that kind of player. Um I really yeah. hope he comes good because, it, again, if we get another uh, youth ca- academy graduate like really playing well in the first team to go along with Saka and to go along with Smithrow, I'll be double as happy because I'm so happy to see these two. And the one we've seen when we and it, when it looked like Inketia was gonna sort of get good and make it, I was so happy for him. And when Reese Nelson was playing more games, I was so happy for him. And so yeah. I really hope that we get more people come through and really, really do it. And I wish I think- the best for Joe. And it couldn't have gone better his loan, really, could it? Yeah, no, he's had a very good time at Newcastle. and he's Scored very more well. than and any Chelsea player this season in the league. Yeah, and he's helped keep them up, I'll be honest. But yeah. the, problem, the problem I've got with Willock and this team, and you know, this isn't any hate on him because he's a certain type of player. And I feel like the, the formation where a 10, um, well, we require a 10, um, especially in the big games, isn't going to work for Willock. Because l- let's take into account, if you play three in midfield... Not instead of two holding and one ten. If you play three in midfield, Willock can play in the team. But if you play two holding and one ten, he he won't fit in this team at all. Yeah. So I'm well, he's about... really really good at covering ground. He's got boundless yeah. energy and he can keep the but pace up for like 70, 80, 90. What I'm trying to allude to, but is the he fact doesn't. That... He's not a presence. No, no. What I'm trying to allude to the fact is like so let, let's say we're playing against Man City, Liverpool, Man United, these bigger teams, right? Mm-hmm. And you've got Partey playing. You don't want Joe Willock next to Partey. And he's not going to start as a 10 in them games because we've got players like Smith Rowe who are a lot better in that position. So you can't play him as a two holding. You can't. You, you just can't play but him. But if we're not going to play him next to Partey, then he's not going to start. Then that's we should I mean. sell him. That, that's what I mean. That's I what I'm trying he, to do. For the amount of money he's worth right now, he yeah. can't be a squad player because we can buy yeah. a squad player of his like hypothetical level to be a bench player for a third of the price. He is worth so much now that if we're not going to give him what he deserves, which is to give him a, like a starting, you know, every game of the season, then yeah. it's better off to to just let him go and be a starter somewhere else yeah, for, for sure. a lot he of could, money. He could only realistically play for a free in midfield. So you know how like Modric, Cruz, and Casemiro kind of play. Yeah, he could only really fit in that kind of system of a midfield free for Arsenal because he's not good enough to be a ten, and he doesn't. He's not a holding midfielder. So he's kind of one of these weird players where he's a box to box midfielder. He'd work. To against... be honest, though, he could probably be a bit of a Suchek type player. Uh, I don't know. I was thinking like Suchek's in... not massively good on the ball, but he gets yeah. there and he scores and he like covers a lot of ground. I was thinking in, in my head like. He'd, he'd be good against the teams where we get predominantly a lot of the ball and we're trying to be a bit more attacking because I, I feel like if we played against, you know, teams like Brighton... No, teams but like... Newcastle play really out of possession a lot and he thrives there. Yeah, but I feel like you you don't need the de- defensive security then. So you could almost play... if When we're playing against these lower league teams that we should be battering, he could almost play as, you know, alongside a Smith Rowe in that kind of position. So there's he's, he'd be a lot further up the pitch and do a lot more damage. But I don't feel like in a holding kind of... You know when we play Partey and Jacker in that position? I just can't see him partnering Partey and doing well in that position. Yeah. And I don't think it's fair on him to put him in that position unless we play a midfield three, which I don't see happening because we've got Smith Rowe and potentially Odegaard. I just don't see... like Arteta clearly favours a 10 and that's not good for Willock. I think we'll have 10. to see... No, no, I think most people do, but I think we're, we're going to have to see how it works. But there's a lot of teams out there that play great football that don't have a 10 at the same time. Yeah, um... I hope Willock makes it here if he decides if he ends up staying, but also I hope he plays really well if he does go to Newcastle and kills it there. So yeah. Mm. But you gotta think like just quickly, like out of the the top teams in the league, like Man United play Bruno Fernandez as a ten. Um yeah, but he can cover so much ground that he can play as an eight at no, the same no, time. No, like he can but... he basically does both. No, he, he actually He's he's okay, but he he does predominantly play as a ten. To me, I, I think, class him just like an advanced like eight. Nah, he's definitely a ten. Let's not chat shit. Man, he covers um, every. He's the he's, he's everywhere. No, he plays as a ten. Let's be honest. Um, so, Man City don't really have a recognised ten. I mean, De Bruyne kind of plays everywhere. Foden kind of plays. No, everywhere. he's exactly the same type of position as uh, Fernandez. I'm not sure how no, you can call one ten and one and eight. They're completely different positions. They play all. O- they literally like they don't play. They play all over the pitch exactly. Middle. No, but Fernandez predominantly plays just behind the striker in the middle of the pitch. I, whatever, whatever. Move on. Yeah, make your point. But I was just trying to say that, like, the only 
you know, there's only like probably one recognised ten that plays at one of the big teams, and that's Man United. So I'm saying it's not essential. Well, which, that we what play would you with count Mount as? Well, Mount plays off the left most of the time. So you don't think that he like, but and so, but so you get people like Foden as well that can yeah. play as a ten, but then they'll be more like. Do you not count that as them like potential because they they, you, they can play as a ten like and. Some would say that their primary position is 10, but they just haven't been at times at club level. So, like, it's difficult to say they don't play as a 10 when they've got 10 no, in the I'm squad. Liverpool formation doesn't set up for playing a 10 apart from Man United's. Like, Liverpool don't play a 10. No. Like, Man City I don't. I mean, arguably, majority. like, Firmino's a weird kind of 10 false nine, but yeah. yeah. But I'm, ju- I'm just trying to say, like, it doesn't mean that we have to settle as always playing a 10. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. You can play a player that is a 10. But a 10 but is so vital to our position. overload system. Yeah. But I, I was just alluding to the fact that like Arteta could switch it up and we might actually be better. Maybe that's what his that's, plan is. Yeah. But I'm saying even if we played, you know, free midfield, but we, you know, adjusted Smith Rowe so he was a little bit further back running onto stuff um, with Willock supporting him, it might work better. But I don't know at this point. You know or I mean? even if you play someone like an Odegaard as a, like a deeper lying playmaker, a long party and Willock to cover oh. ground. I know you don't want to see him, but... No, I, I, I mean, I, I want to. He had a really good clear. game. I want to get this clear. And he had a good game against Brighton. I mean, he had, yeah, he had a decent game. It wasn't anything special. It was a lot like his average games. That he's well, had. getting an assist, I know. Oh, well, it wasn't. He didn't do anything for the assist. He just passed it forward. To no, Pepe. it was a good ball. Pepe made him get an assist. It wasn't the other way around. <laughs> um, <laughs> but what I'm trying to allude to is the fact that, like, Odegaard has had. Four, four or five good games he's had 10 to 12 average and poor games so I mean I'm not trying to hate on him like I w- obviously want him to do the best and if he stays at Arsenal I want him to do the best I just think judging off the basis that we've seen he's not worth anything over 40 million and I think if we if we can get him I said we said it last week I said if we can get him for around 25 yeah, 30 million never get him for 25. Then we'll keep, but then I, I just I feel like there's better plays out that we can go for Buendia is definitely a better option I feel yeah, like he's, he's also got more three years older but Maybe that's what we need. Sometimes we need a bit. Well, you know, you can have all these good young players, but you need a bit of experience in there too. Yeah, but experience sort of means played everywhere, played all over the world, and been a top player in the top yeah. leagues and played in the World Cup and all this. Whereas Brendy has been in the Championship for last season. Yeah, I know, but he was the best player in the Championship last season. And that's also worth remembering. Yeah. And that there's a lot of talent in the Championship, and we don't notoriously shop in the Championship. And I would take you know, I would take Tony, and I would take Brendy. That's what I mean. That's that's what I'm trying to say. I hope we go for Tony. We won't, but we we like it would yeah, be. A, we, like, we should. I reckon he's got. I think he'd crush it. I think he'd he'd, he'd suit Ooh, our system quite well because Brentford plays similar football to how we play. Really, when you actually if you watch him play, so I feel like he'd actually probably fit in quite well. Well, they might but, get promoted. If they don't, then it'll be easier to buy him. Yeah, no, that's what I think. I said I can't remember if I sent it to you or someone else the other day, and I was saying that um, if they don't get promoted, his value goes down. If they get promoted, his value goes right up. Because there's also the player will be desperate to leave, and then you mm. know there's potential that we can get him through that way. But we will have to see what happens. I feel I feel so sorry for Brentford if they don't go up again. Well, they just they, get they just get taken apart every year when they miss the playoffs and all their players they're, they're get basically, poached. They're basically like the Leicester slash Tottenham of the Championship. They're bottlers. Ah. Uh, bit harsh but uh, you know what i mean well leicester's on bottlers because they won their fake up i kind of hope bottlers. swansea win just so we can poach all their players which we won't even buy anyway i'd <laughs> rather see a london maybe. club in the premier league though yeah no I've, I've i've been looking forward to seeing brentford in the premier league they I, have I deserved really it for a while well. now and they haven't they haven't been in the premier league for so long and i feel like um you know swansea have been in and about for quite a, you know they've been out of it for a few years now but they've they've been in the premier league enough times that i want to see someone new in mm-hmm. Brentford but yeah I don't know where we're going with this <laughs> uh, apparently we're after their keeper as well if Leno leaves of like same as last mm, year but I'm not, not sure, sure about that I'm not sure about that I feel like I, I definitely you know I've, I've been I've been critical of Leno but I definitely prefer Leno over I think it's Mayer or Raya Raya is David it Raya, Raya? Yeah. Well, whatever he's called but I've seen him do a lot of dubious things I just where... remember him getting caught off the line from the in the playoff yeah, game Fulham against goal. Fulham yeah. <laughs> that was bad mate. but apparently they bad. 
the video footage people had seen that as a thing and and joe Bryan was instructed to watch for those gaps for him. it wasn't like a spontaneous thing it was like we yeah. know that he has a tendency to do this don't be afraid of just curling one around him if he does do this and that's big up to the coaches who've discovered that because that's a massive hit it's that. also, that's it's a 100 also, million pound discovery <laughs> it's also one of the things where you know like notoriously you know when like a goalkeeper knows where a striker predominantly like wants to put his penalty yeah and they'll go that way because but the, the strikers average... know that they know that now so it's kind of been like yeah. mixed up but i mean like you've seen it like throughout history where like keepers were like oh i know he always goes to the right so that's why i went that mm. way because i've watched him it's kind of like that like but now they, they practice kind of them so the strikers do 50 50 now yeah exactly right got the stats. You got any, any i know you're trying to end this let's end it here. i'm not trying i'm not trying to end it man it was um there, it's but... been wonderful doing these for the second half of the season and we'll yep. be back obviously with the with the the podcast next season i'm sure we'll do more throughout the summer oh, to keep you lot entertained as to try and harvest the views and get the clout that we can get yeah. on youtube chasing the arsenal clout forever <laughs> <laughs> so weird, it's been a pleasure to do these yeah. 34 episodes um and the highs and lows of the season mostly lows but hopefully some highs coming yeah. up in the future um will be about Thanks for, for listening if you've made it through these episodes and if you found us along the way, then we really appreciate that. We've got 130 subscribers now. Crazy, 30. crazy. 133, we're growing. Yeah. Crazy stuff. So we really appreciate everyone who's been been watching our clips and watching the podcast, as well as listening to us on Spotify, on Apple Music, uh, yeah. Apple Podcasts, whatever, all the other ones as well. We've got some listeners on there. So we really appreciate you all and we will be back when we're back. And we're going to see how we can up the levels again and again 100%. going forward so watch out for new content give us your opinions if we do try something new whether you like it whether it's better whether it's worse and we'll sort of tease some things split a b test it and see if it works or not and then um we'll work out what we want to do so yeah cheers we appreciate you all but